Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro. I am your servant in Jesus Christ. This is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. Now, real quick, big shout out to our crew members. You're the ones who make it possible for us to continue to bring Fighting for the Faith to you and to the world. And just want to say thank you for your support. Now, let me ask you this question. Um, are any of you spend any time in charismatic and Pentecostal churches? Uh, then you're aware of this phenomenon. And the phenomena, phenomena, da, 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 phenomena, da, da. <laughs> sorry, I distracted myself. Anyway, the, the phenomena is that um, they are prone to telling tall tales, you know, kind of like the legend of Pecos Bill or Paul Bunyan and his, his big blue ox babe or blue or whatever that ox's, ox's name is, right? Uh, but uh, they're prone to telling tall tales. What if I were to tell you that... Um, I'm going to be sharing with you an example of this from, of all people, Jurgen Mathesius of, uh, of now Awakened Church in San Diego, formerly C3 Church of San Diego. And yes, he has very strong connections with Phil Pringle. Uh, and, uh, and anyway, we're going to hear a story. We're going to hear a story of how he saved Christians during the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989. How did he save Christians from being massacred during the Tiananmen Square massacre? Um, well, I let's well, let's just say that you need to stay tuned to get some of the details. But this is an example of tall tales, and even worse, it's uh, it's an example of a false teaching regarding the gifts of the Spirit. I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I, I do that from time. Time, time. So let's uh, whirl up the desktop. Uh, that's a recent photo that I took. In fact, if you want to see it in its entirety, uh, there, there it is. Uh, that's a sunset photo I took of the crescent moon just a couple weeks ago over in Radium, Minnesota. But uh, that's not why we're here. But uh, I, you know, I, I, I like photography. It's my thing. You know, uh, it's the way I stay sane. So uh, that was uh, something that actually turned out pretty well. I was happy about that. So I thought I'd share it with you. But uh, uh, let me uh, <clears throat> let me pull up this instead, shall we? And uh, what we're looking at here is uh, our web browser. And this is from a sermon preached almost a year ago, not quite, uh, by Jurgen Mathesius on Pentecost Sunday back in 2022. Seems like a long time ago now, doesn't it? But uh, as we listen to this, he's going to talk about how he... Uh, practically single-handedly, saved a bunch of Christians during the Tiananmen Square massacre. This is a great example of unverifiable tall tales, which is a phenomenon na, 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 in the uh, Pentecostal movement, if you know what I mean. All right, so let's uh, let's whirl this up and let's get this going. Uh, he, here's Jurgen Mathesius to share the details of how he saved Christians at Tiananmen Square. It is an incredibly powerful thing. When I got baptized with the Holy Spirit on the 2nd of January, 1989, it was maybe a few weeks later, I was in my room praying. And as I was just kind of praying in the spirit uh, in my room, my, all of a sudden it was, like, it was like I had a knot in my stomach. Like this knot came. And, and, and as this knot came, I felt like this, oh, like this groaning, like I just had to pray. Now, real quick, didn't mention it at the moment that he said it because it happened so quick. Lickety split, if you would. Um, there is no second baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's a false doctrine, okay? Uh, in fact, let's do this. If we were to go to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter four, you're going to note something here, okay? Uh, the apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Yeah, this idea that there's a second baptism of the Holy Spirit as evidenced by speaking in tongues, false doctrine. There is one baptism. There is no second baptism of the Holy Spirit, especially a baptism of the Holy Spirit as evidenced by speaking in tongues. Again, I would point to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where the Apostle Paul asked this question, a series of questions, and because we have the, the untranslated Greek particle may in each of these questions, that means each of the questions must be answered in the negative. 
And the question is, are all apostles? May Pontus Apostoloi? The answer is no. May Pontus Prophetai? Are all prophets? No. Uh, or, may Pontus Didaskoloi? Are all teachers? No. May Pontus Dunamis? Do all perform miracles? The answer is no. Uh, may Pontus Charismata Exusin Iamaton? Uh, do all possess gifts of healing? The answer is again, no. And then you get to the, this question May Pontus Glossis la lucin, do all speak in tongues? The answer is no. So there is no second baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We'll talk about what the purpose of uh, of tongues is shortly here. But uh, let's let's get back to his storytelling. Uh, this is the the legend of Pecos Bill, um, Jurgen Mathesius style. I mean, I'm I'm wondering if he should get it a, a Nobel Peace Prize for his uh, efforts at saving Christians during the Tiananmen Square massacre. It, it seems appropriate, especially after you hear the details of this particular <clears throat> intervention on his part. I had to pray and the Spirit of God came upon me and I didn't realize I was interceding for something. But all of a sudden my tongue changed. Instead of instead of that, I started going, Yong, dang, ying, bang, dang, dang, dong. I'm like, oh my gosh, this sounds so silly. Stop it. And so <clears throat> Does the word cringe mean anything so to, I tried to you? But every time I stopped, I couldn't stop. And, and, and I knew it was some type of Asian dialect, but I kept trying to stop because it was awkward. And my brother was in his bedroom right next door to mine. And I thought, if he hears me and he's not a Christian, he's going to you know, go and tell mom and dad. And you know, I wasn't smart with the gift. Like the night I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, 2nd of January, 1989, on the 3rd of January, I burst into my mom and dad's bedroom. And my dad, because he was an atheist, I shook him and said, Dad! And he, you know, he thought someone broke into the house or the house was on fire. I wasn't smart. I said, Dad, you don't believe in God? Explain this. And so I was that close to getting shipped off to the funny farm. And so anyway, so now this is... Yeah, gibberish is not exactly what I would consider an awe-inspiring sign for unbelievers. Keep that in mind, at least unbelievers who, uh, uh, who are atheists. Th there is a very specific reason why tongues is given, and it is a sign for unbelievers, but a very specific set of unbelievers. We'll talk about that in three a Three weeks later, three weeks later, I'm thinking, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to get the Holy Spirit to behave, but he's like, for, for the next 45 minutes, it's, I'm like, oh, dear God, it's over, it's over. They're going to put me in one of those beautiful white jackets that do up at the back. Put me in a nice little padded cell. You know, it's like I'm just... And so anyway, after about 45, 45 minutes, you're dying, I'm on, like just like groaning like this. As soon as I felt that burden release and the spirit left, I thought, I've got to get away from God. I've got to get out of here. And, and I thought, where do I go? Where do I go? And then I remembered my dad. He's an atheist. And so I ran and my dad was sitting on the sofa watching the evening news. And I ran, I jumped next to my dad thinking, I'll be safe here. God, he's far from God. And so that's what I thought. And as I sat down, he's watching the news. And on the news was the Tiananmen Square Massacre, 1989. Not sure if you remember, but there are pictures where you see tanks. And there are people standing in front of the tanks. And there's this beautiful picture. Um, it's one person. Um, it, so we'll put a link to this video in the description down below. Uh, viewer discretion advised. Uh, but this was something put out by CNN uh, just a couple of months ago. Uh, uh, you know, rarely seen video of the 1989 uh, protests in China. And uh, here you have the famous kind of iconic uh, you know, shot of this fellow with bags standing in front of tanks and about ready to be mowed over. Uh, you know it, that, but he didn't end up getting mowed over. That that's not how that went down. But that that's kind of the iconic shot from the 1989 June of 1989 uh, portion of the Tiananmen Square massacre. At the end, the protests lasted for months. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the history of Tiananmen Square and what took place in 1989 in China. Uh, as the Soviet Union was collapsing, uh, you know, things were becoming unsettled and unre there was a lot of unrest in China at the same time as well. Um, worth the watch. So we'll put a link to this down below. Again, viewer discretion is advised. But now watch what Jurgen is going to claim. There's a front cover of Time magazine where there's a man standing in front of a tank refusing to move. They'd actually given the order to the tanks to run over people, which they had been doing. And as I'm watching this, the Holy Spirit said to me, you just prayed for that. Now, I've never been there. That's not the purpose of tongues. And this is absolutely delusional. 
But uh, let's let him finish out his yarn, shall we? I'd never we? been to Tiananmen Square. I'd never even been to, to China or that region of the world. But the Spirit of God was looking for somebody that he could come upon to intercede. Romans 8.26 says, you don't know how to pray as you ought. Yeah, Romans 8.26, you are misappropriating that text. Let's take a look at it real quick here. Uh, Romans chapter 8, specifically verse 26 Uh, Here's what the text says. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. This has absolutely nothing, zero, to do with uh, with with tongues at all. So uh, he just used, misappropriated this text uh, for his own purposes, but that's not what tongues is about, and that text is not talking about tongues. So the Spirit himself intercedes on our behalf with groanings and words that can't be uttered. God is always just looking for a vessel, and when you pray in tongues, when you're praying in the Spirit, it is you're allowing the Holy Spirit to pray through you on behalf of something, instead of your head trying to... No text says this. Again, well, how could that happen? Oh, that thoroughly. I don't believe you. Instead of your brain getting in, get, your spirit is praying. The Holy Ghost is able to, to pray through you as a vessel to bring shift. So watch this. Sort of- as a vessel to bring shift, right? Um, here's the thing. No biblical text says that about tongues. Tongues, tongues are, is a sign gift to a very specific group of unbelievers. I'll explain more now, in a four minute. Four months later, four months later, Wollongong Church of Christ, where I met my Liani, they had a missionary come. And the missionary told the story. And this is where it got freaky. He told the story. Uh, he was a missionary to Tiananmen Square. He said... Missionary to T- Tiananmen Square. When, does, when did China allow missionaries? Uh, uh, when were people sending missionaries to Tiananmen Square? I would note, you need to watch this 18, almost 19 minute documentary on the rarely seen footage coming out of the Tiananmen Square event that was multi-month long. And just ask yourself this question, is what he's saying in this tall tale of his, uh, does it square historically with what happens in China and what happened during Tiananmen Square? Tiananmen Square was a multi-month-long protest by college-aged Chinese students uh, that w- abruptly came to an end in June of 1989 um, because the Chinese government said enough. And so already I've got a question. Wh- wh- what's a missionary to Tiananmen Square? When did China start allowing Christian missionaries in and uh, it, it's so <clears throat> that's the thing with these tall tales, you know, you can never really verify them. And this is quite a tall tale. But let, let me back this up just a little bit here as he's now going to give us the final resolve in this Pecos Bill account of his where he saved a bunch of Christians during the Tiananmen Square uh, Four massacre. months later, four months later, Wollongong Church of Christ, where I met my Liani, they had a missionary come. And the missionary told the story. And this is where it got freaky. He told the story. Uh, he was a missionary to Tiananmen Square. He said that the, 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 these, these tanks were running over people until they got to a group of Christians who stood there willing to, to lay down their lives, willing to be martyrs, to stand up for, for, against the corruption. And they held hands and they began to pray. And he said there was a surge, a surge of power went through the electronic systems of all the tanks. And it shorted all the tanks so that none of the tanks could move forward. Everything went doo, 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 just went black and blacked out. And, and then the Holy Ghost said, when you were praying, that's what you were praying for. Well, there you go. Jürgen Mathesius, the hero of Tiananmen Square, unsung until now. I mean, I'm so glad that we're finally able to share this detail with the world. Uh, We'll be sending this information on to the people who uh, hand out the Nobel Peace Prize so that uh, Jürgen Mathesius can now be honored properly for his involvement, his intercessory tongues prayer in a cringy sounding Asian dialect that uh, that resulted in tanks having a power surge just knock them out boom 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 one by one mhm yeah right he- here's the thing that's not what tongues is about okay 
Let's take a look at what the scripture says. We're going to look at New Testament text. We're going to look at an Old Testament text. But we're going to go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Okay. And here's what, uh, let's see here. I want to back this up. This makes in the tongue, nevertheless. All right. All right, therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret, the scripture says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I'll pray with my spirit, but also pray with my mind also. I'll sing with my, sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For, we, for you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person's not being built up. You'll you'll note that this is part of Paul's argument as to why tongues should not be practiced in church unless there is an interpreter. So he then goes on to say, nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind uh, in in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So brothers, uh, do not be children in your thinking. It be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. In the law, all right, so this is found in the Old Testament, it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people. This people? Which people is that? Unbelieving Jews, okay? I, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me says the Lord. Now, this is quoted from the book of Isaiah, and uh, it is found in Isaiah chapter 28, verses 11 and 12. What Paul is doing here is taking Isaiah's prophecy from 28, verses 11 and 12, and showing that tongues is the fulfillment of it. And God specifically wrote, had Isaiah write Isaiah 28, 11 through 12. Let's take a look at it, Isaiah 28. And we'll note 11 through 12 says, For by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, Yahweh will speak to this people, unbelieving Jews. Uh, To whom he has said, this is rest, give rest to the weary, and this is repose, yet they would not hear. Okay, then the Apostle Paul makes it very clear then that that, that what tongues is, is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. It's a sign to unbelieving Jews. And it makes sense if you think about it, because the Jews know where languages came from. Scripture tells us that, that all the different languages of the earth came as a result of man's rebellion during the tab- Tower of Babel affair. Yeah, see the early chapters of the book of Genesis for more details. And so what tongues is, it's a sign gift to unbelieving Jews because they would hear the, these people speaking to them in languages they had not studied, proclaiming the wonders of God and that's a sign to them. It's a fulfillment of that specific prophecy. So there, note then when he says, thus tongues are a sign. Tongues isn't a prayer language. Tongues are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. That's their purpose. And if you were to go back to the book of Acts chapter 2, when tongues first arrive. Uh, It says, uh, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. This is the Christians. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together. They were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Tongues are human languages and a sign to unbelieving Jews. That's the reason why it's a sign gift. And you'll note that tongues are not an edification gift unless there's an interpreter. That's why Paul says, you are not permitted to speak in tongues without uh, without an interpreter. The purpose of the gifts of the Spirit are not merely sign gifts, but also gifts for the purpose of edifying and building up the body of Christ. And when the body of Christ is gathered together to hear the word and to worship God, 
God, then only the edification gifts are to be practiced, period. And if, uh, if somebody speaks in tongues and there's no one there to interpret, there is no edification. Therefore, the one who speaks in church must be silent. And you're not permitted to just blabber on without an interpreter. It's forbidden by God, the Holy Spirit who commanded the apostle Paul to write these things, right? So they were all amazed. They were astonished saying, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthenians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. All were amazed and perplexed, and that's the purpose of tongues. Tongues is not a prayer language. That's not its purpose. It's a sign gift. And so Jürgen Mathesius here is not only teaching false doctrine as it relates to tongues, uh, like many, 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 many in the charismatic Pentecostal and NAR movements, he's, uh, he's telling tall tales. This is the phenomena that we've noticed in the, uh, in the uh, charismatic NAR and Pentecostal churches, the phenomena, the, da, 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 the phenomena to tell tall tales, to tell stories of exploits and things like this without any actual evidence to be able to verify it. That's exactly what he was doing. And so we will we'll, we'll just reject it out of hand. And I'm sorry, but I, I take back what I said, Jurgen. I will not be uh, informing the, uh, the people who hand out the Nobel Peace Prize that you are the unsung hero uh, who saved a group of Christians through your speaking in tongues back in 1989. This is just one of those unverifiable, probably not even historically true, made up kind of stories, you know, like Pecos Bill and Paul Bunyan and things like that, that are, well, that a lot of charismatics tell. Now, before we <coughs> sign off here, I would note something. Jürgen is a very dangerous man, and I mean that, because you'll note when somebody has no conscience, and can tell tall tales and exploit people with false words like these, uh, when they have no conscience uh, and they are drawing attention to themselves in this way, they become dangerously close to being like cult leaders. And that's exactly the, the direction that Jürgen Mathesius is heading if he's not already there. And in this exact sermon, he said something that I think the folks of San Diego need to take to heart and consider that he thinks that he's going to follow through on this. And this should be a warning to you, but listen to what he says. So, you know, so I, so let me just tell you until the sky splits, we're going to be buying buildings. We're going to be raising leaders. We're going to be anointing and ordaining pastors and ministers. We're going to be invading territory. We're going to, we're going to be invading territory, going to be flipping tables of corruption. Flipping tables of corruption. We're going to be putting in great leaders. We're going to be putting in great leaders. Uh, you folks who live in San Diego, you have a problem. And that is, is that Jurgen is just like Brian Houston and Carl Lentz and Phil Pringle. They're all, they're all birds of the same feather. He's one of these seven mountain dominionist kind of guys. And uh, the best way I can put it is, is that what Jurgen is saying here is that they, Awakened Church of San Diego, is going to take over the political scene there in San Diego, and they're going to put their leaders in place. And their people are going to politically take over San Diego. And believe me when I tell you, um, we've seen patterns like this before. Okay, you all, you all have ever heard of Jim Jones? He was the same way. And Jurgen Mathesius, the guy's delusional. The guy is absolutely at, just delusional to think that he is the one who saved Tiananmen Square. And this is just one example of the delusional stuff that we hear from this guy. This guy is this close to being a cult leader if he isn't already one of them. And those of you in San Diego had better pay attention because 
these stories never end well. And if Jurgen and Awaken Church succeeds in taking over city councils and county governments and things like this, oh man, you haven't even begun to see corruption yet. Uh, it just take a look at what happened in Australia with Hillsong. And that's what's coming to San Diego. So just want to give a shout out to you folks in San Diego. You got a big problem in your hands. You have a cult in your backyard. So hopefully you found this helpful. If so, all the information on how you can share the video is down below in the description. And if you would like to join the fight by joining our crew and financially supporting us, all the information on how you can join our crew is also in the description. And until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen. Amen.